Hi, welcome to the show. This is Mario <coughs> Thomas, and um, I'm the host and producer of Getting High on Anthropology. Today we have a guest, David Bush. He's an attorney, and he's with the in Industrial Hemp Research Foundation here in Colorado. Welcome to the show, David. Thank you, Marty. Glad to be here. So tell us about your background, and then, of course, we'll go into the work of the foundation. Well, I'm an attorney. Uh, I practice with the Hoban Law Group. It's uh, a uh, national uh, hemp and marijuana practice. Uh, we are starting to open international uh, offices as well, and we try to be a, a general business and dispute resolution firm for the cannabis industry, whether it's hemp or marijuana. Um, three and a half years ago, this is before I, I joined the Hoban Law Group, I uh, founded the Industrial Hemp Research Foundation. Uh, the need that I saw was that there was really not very much known about industrial hemp at the time, and there wasn't any government money to support research. And I saw tremendous resources at universities all over the country. There were a lot of people in those universities who wanted to do research and weren't getting the funding to make that possible. So the idea with the foundation was to generate private sources of funding, uh, to go out to industry and try to convince people that it was in their interest to support research so that they could develop better products and, uh, and be able to make products uh, perhaps more cost effectively, more efficiently. Uh, and so that was the, uh, the idea, the mission behind the foundation was to raise funds to support hemp-related education and academic research at institutions of higher education. Uh, it's a 501c3 tax-exempt nonprofit Colorado corporation, so all donations to the foundation are fully tax-deductible to the extent people can claim tax deductions. And as we know, Marty, that is a, a bit of a challenge uh, in uh, much of the uh, cannabis industry these days. Uh, but we offer that, and uh, we also try to do uh, community outreach and education. Uh, so we stage uh, public events, and uh, we're actually working together to put uh, another one on, uh, and that is a way that we can reach the public, tell them about ourselves, and educate them as well about subjects of interest to them. So David, let's backpedal a bit. <coughs> There's gonna be some people, and I'm sure you have these conversations all the time, that conflate hemp with you know, THC-infused marijuana. So for the uninitiated, how would you describe hemp as a plant and a commodity and a product that you're, you work with in the foundation? Sure. Uh, it's a loaded question. <laughs> I should start with that. Um, we start with a plant. It's uh, the plant of genus cannabis. And the cannabis plant has many different uses and it has many different varieties. It's what I, what I literally call a dog. If you think about a dog and how many ways that you can breed a dog and have big ones and yellow ones and red ones and small ones, uh, different shaped heads, incredible variety in that species. And that really is, is what I find in cannabis. It's incredibly variable. One of the dimensions of variation in the cannabis plant is in the concentration of a particular chemical, a cannabinoid that's called tetrahydrocannabinol, Delta-9. That's the stuff that gets you high and what we always associate with marijuana. Uh, the only thing that distinguishes hemp is it doesn't have very much THC. And other than that, it's a cannabis plant just like any other. When you say it doesn't have very much, because I know even that to quantify is, is a hot topic. So specify in Colorado, and if it contrasts at the federal level with in terms of content of um, uh, THC in hemp. Well, there is a, a default concentration that is uh, spelled out in almost every jurisdiction in the United States at any level of government you want to talk about. Uh, almost without exception, they use the same concentration, and that is 0.3% THC by dry weight. And how that was arrived at was really an historic accident. Uh, it's, it's hard to say what it really means and what the significance of it is, other than to say it's the standard everyone's adopted. And so that's what we see in Colorado. 
and at the federal level to the extent that industrial hemp is defined at the federal level in federal law that's the concentration that is used to identify the threshold that will divide marijuana and industrial hemp. So I'm really interested in more at the federal level and then of course the direction you're going with the foundation but um, I also want to know a bit about you. So do okay. you have like a law degree with specialization in hemp? Like how did you get no. into this uh, area? No. <laughs> the answer is no. Um, there, uh, to my knowledge, there is no legal specialty in hemp that is taught anywhere, at least in this country. Uh, and it's kind of like in Colorado. You look around Colorado and just about everybody you meet came from somewhere else. Okay, you look at people who practice in the cannabis industry, uh, and especially in hemp, they came from somewhere else too. And I came from somewhere else. I, I was a commercial litigation attorney for decades and it was really only fairly recently, about four years ago, that I gravitated towards industrial hemp to the point where that is almost exclusively my practice now. And so for someone who's new to the link between hemp and law, could you give us, and I know you have certain uh, parameters you have to follow, but can you tell us like one or two kinds of cases that you deal with in the area of industrial hemp? Uh, well, sure. I, a, a lot of what we do is regulatory compliance, that, that people will come to us and they'll want to know what can I do, uh, what's legal and what's not. And uh, they, they may have questions about how do they advertise their products? Uh, what can I say about them uh, that's not going to get me in trouble? Uh, how can I make them? Where can I send them? Can, can I market my products in pick a state, Massachusetts, Iowa? Uh, can I market it there and how do I get it there? Uh, so there's a lot of questions like that. Um, th there may be issues that arise in Colorado under our regulatory system for hemp, and uh, there are problems people have all the time. Um, beyond that, um, w we do a lot of just business law because this is another business, and you can't forget that. So much of what we do is contract law. It's helping people organize corporations, uh, establish the governing documents for those, those companies. They may have disputes. They may have corporate divorces. We, we do a lot of that, where people are splitting up because they are going in different directions. Uh, there's dispute resolution. We do a lot of that, where people are getting sued or suing someone else, or they have a claim they would rather not reduce to litigation if they could. We help them resolve those. Uh, real estate. We have real estate attorneys in our office. We have a security attorney. We have tax attorneys. Uh, so all kinds of legal needs like that that every business will have and it's not different in hemp. And so through your work you found there was this unmet need and then you established with your colleagues the foundation. So tell us about the beginning of the foundation and maybe one or two of the accomplishments that you're happy with or you're pleased with so far. Oh, with the foundation, sure. Well, as I said, uh, organized the foundation originally because there seemed to be this great unmet need, that there were people in universities who were qualified and interested in doing research in genetics and agronomy and economics, you name it, and there simply was not the government support. I mean, to this day, there's only limited government money that's going into hemp research. It's turning around. Things are a lot better than when we started the foundation, but... Um, we're not there yet and may not be for some time to come. So uh, we thought that there was a, a need and we started talking to people in universities. We, we visited with professors and went out to lunch with them and, and asked them, you know, what's going on? Uh, well, what are you interested in? What would you like to see happen? How can we help you? And based on that, uh, then we organized the foundation and uh, what I'm very pleased about is that we have gotten a lot of interest. Uh, we, we have uh, gotten uh, not only the foundation organized, we've also created something called our Science Advisory Council. And that's composed of uh, people who are highly qualified in their respective fields, and they're just advising us on what kind of research projects could we support that would really uh, meet some need and interest in the community. We will get all kinds of proposals from researchers saying, I'd like to do this, can you help me? And so that's something that we review with the council and uh, we, we try to come up with uh, 
a, a match of potential donors to these projects. And we have some of those that are in process right now that are very exciting. Um, there's a, and I, I don't think I can name names, but, but there, there is a, a, a major corporation that is interested in exploring uh, the efficacy of different kinds of lighting systems for cultivation in greenhouse settings. And so we have someone that has prepared a project and, and that's on the verge of getting funded. Uh, and it's gonna, I'm sure, produce some very interesting results. We, we have some uh, research that has been proposed more in the biology and medical fields to evaluate uh, the effect of, say, cannabidiol, which is a, uh, a substance of great interest in the industry, um, how that affects brains and, and uh, memory patterns. Um, there's been a lot of research on post-traumatic stress disorder and interest in furthering that. So uh, we have been uh, getting a lot of interest from a lot of researchers on projects they'd like to do. And uh, the same token, we've had uh, a lot of interest from uh, potential donors that would like to support these projects. And as you know, David, I'm a professor in the anthropology department at UC Denver. So I'm familiar through my cannabis related research, looking at um, cannabis workers and trimmers and respiratory health, that yeah. there's some um, procedures and protocols to follow in the university. So one question I have for you, <laughs> have you been successful working with universities getting cannabis industry funding through the university structures to fund a professor to do work? So I'm just curious how you have overcome or uh, recognize you can't overcome that problem. Oh, nothing's insurmountable, but they sometimes take longer. There, there's more complexity. So uh, for example, projects that we have uh, been involved in formulating that require products to be brought on campus, finished products, and this is most typically in, in your, your, again, your cannabidiol area. Um, that has required us to develop a, a special agreement with the universities. It's called a materials transfer agreement. And so we have that contract form, and it's actually something that we don't enter into. It's between the donor who is actually providing the product and the university. Uh, so that's a hoop we have to jump through. There's uh, animal research and uh, every university has these divisions that make sure that the animals are treated ethically. And so um, right now we're looking at two animal feed studies and those are going to have to be approved by the appropriate divisions of the university to make sure that the animals are not going to suffer unduly from eating hemp laced foods. Um, so every project has its own demands and its own administrative loop, uh, not loopholes, excuse me, uh, hurdles that we have to clear. Um, but the universities are getting better and better at dealing with us and they know who we are and they're familiar with the issues. And so when they come along, we're getting better and faster at dealing with each one to get a project approved. That's excellent. And it seems like most of your work is here in the state of Colorado. So is this from your perspective and experience, is this the right place to be for doing industrial hemp research and projects to advance the sector? I don't know if I would say the right place to be, it's one of the best places to be. Uh, Colorado has an excellent institutional environment because we have an excellent legal system that is supportive of cannabis, uh, perhaps more so than any other state. Uh, our, our regulatory systems are working and there's always complaints that arise, there's things people would like to see better, but they really are working to a far greater extent than I have seen with uh, many other states where they just have problems, interruptions, and delays that we typically aren't experiencing here. Um, so yeah, I, I feel very fortunate to be in Colorado. If I had not moved to Colorado, which had nothing to do with the cannabis industry, this, I came here way before any of that happened, I got lucky. I, I was just living here and all this happened around me and we have this wonderful institutional environment with dedicated people in both industry and in government that are making it happen. And because of that, we can have the foundation operate here. That's great. And just so we can drill down a bit to some specific issues, what one or two regulatory systems can you talk about that are working well related to industrial hemp in Colorado? Like, do you have any examples that just could help us grasp some of the, these systems at the regulatory level? Sure. Almost exclusively, the regulation of hemp in the state of Colorado is of cultivation. 
and the, the, almost all the regulation ends at harvest. And we started off with a pretty good system, and there were some adjustments to that system in the first couple of years, but it's operating very efficiently. And uh, the, the regulators uh, generally have very good relationship with the industry too. Um, and, and we see that that is really progressing. Uh, it's, what's coming right now is certified seed, uh, that that's uh, a program that started a couple of years ago in Colorado. We don't have commercially available certified seed yet, but when we do, which is expected to really happen within the next year, people are going to be able to buy certified seed. And what that means is that they are essentially guaranteed that if they grow it under the conditions under which that seed was certified, they are going to produce a mature plant that actually is industrial hemp that falls below or at that tr threshold of, of uh, THC so that they can legally grow it, harvest it, make products with it. To date, it has been a bit of a gamble for a lot of people. They don't know necessarily if what they're growing is going to pass muster with the testing for THC. So certified seed is something that's coming. It's almost here. It's been actively under development for the last couple of years in this state. That's going to make things so much faster, so much more efficient for people to grow hemp with confidence in the state and not have that risk of losing their crop because it tests too high. And then would that be through the Department of Agriculture? And the, what's the timeline you think on that? Well, I, I think with, within the next year, it, it's, it's a it's extended process, which is something that, that many people don't really appreciate about certified seed, uh, that there has to be a stable cultivar, first of all, that someone introduces and says, this is what I want to certify. Um, so you have to have a stable cultivar, and then there's a, a series of, of tests that are administered by the Department of Agriculture to confirm that that particular cultivar will produce seeds that, when you grow them, generate uh, mature plants that meet the legal threshold for THC. Um, and then there's a lot of other things that have to be done, too, in the seed certification process. That's all handled by the Department of Agriculture. There is a lab at uh, Colorado State University in Fort Collins that, uh, that does the, the latter part of the certification process. Um, and believe it or not, this is really being administered by one person it's, in the Department of Agriculture. One very overworked person, I should say. That's amazing, but yeah. it's such important work. And it I is very important. Just for, again, for viewers who are new to industrial hemp in Colorado, could you provide a little portrait on what is the sector like in general in terms of either, you know, approximations of the size, you know, how many farmers, are we um, uh, exporting, you know, just little details about sure. the hemp sector in Colorado. Yeah, it's really evolved. I mean, what we have today is nothing like it was four years ago. The first legal hemp harvest in Colorado were in 2014. So it really has all happened in the last four years. What we saw in the beginning was uh, there were very small plots, very small farms. I mean, we're talking fractions of an acre at times that were under cultivation. And they were what we call the economics uh, business. They were vertically integrated enterprises that the same person would grow hemp on their little plot of land. They would extract whatever they wanted to or process it however they did in their garage or in their kitchen. And in the, another room of the house, perhaps, they would, they would package up something to sell. So it was all a ma and pa operation done at home, very small scale, uh, not very much unlike the way industry operated in this country back in the 1700s, 1800s, you know, uh, very, very low tech, very small. Uh, we have seen tremendous changes in that in the last few years so that uh, there's more differentiation of labor. You, you have companies that now exist just to produce cuttings of plants to sell to other people. You have people who just raise hemp and sell it to processors. You have people who are just processors. You could not find a contract processor. If you wanted to extract cannabidiol from industrial hemp a few years ago, you had to do it yourself. Wow. There was nobody who provided that service. Now there are lots of people who provide that service, and that's all they do, and they do it very well. So we are seeing a maturation in the industry. And that's very exciting to see. Yeah, We're no. seeing more lawsuits, okay? As a lawyer, I can tell you, when you see a lot of lawsuits, something is happening. There's a lot of business going on. A lot of people are getting mad at each other because things aren't happening the way they'd like. 
we didn't have lawsuits a few years ago. There weren't enough people getting in each other's way to have lawsuits. Now we do. That's great how <laughs> lawsuits, the number of lawsuits is like an index yeah. to, the, to the sector. Not, not so that that's a good thing for the person in it, but it does indicate the industry is maturing. Yeah. So we have a few more minutes, and I thought it might be good with your expertise if you could uh, help us understand at the federal level what any exciting movement happening in terms of industrial hemp. Oh, absolutely. Uh, well, the, the main thing that's happening right now is that there is uh, legislation that has been uh, proposed. It's actually in conference committee right now in Congress, uh, and that is uh, provisions in the new Farm Bill is, is what we kind of colloquially call it. Uh, it's technically the 2018 Agricultural Improvement Act. It's a massive law that is renewed about every five years in this country. And it's a hodgepodge of everything from research grants to universities to food stamps to price supports for farmers, about almost anything you can think of that has anything to do with agriculture is touched by the farm bill. And it, so it's literally hundreds and hundreds of pages in one bill that is passed by Congress every five years. What is remarkable this year is that there are a series of proposals in the act that would legalize hemp at the federal level. Excellent. Uh, that was passed by the Senate. Uh, the version that was passed in the House did not include the hemp provisions. And that's why it is now in conference committee. Representatives from both the House and the Senate are there to work out their differences to come up with a farm bill that could be introduced uh, back to their respective houses for a vote. And that is the process right now that it's in. It hasn't uh, gotten out of the conference committee and probably will not until sometime after the midterm elections. And so uh, if it does pass the way we want it to, what would be some immediate implications? The, okay, uh, there are a lot of immediate implications. It would remove industrial hemp from the Controlled Substances Act. So hemp would no longer be considered a dangerous drug, which uh, to date, it has been under federal law, under the Controlled Substances Act. That would be eliminated. Uh, there would be crop insurance available for farmers that grow hemp outdoors. They haven't been able to get that because of the controlled substance status of hemp. Uh, there would be uh, banking available freely. And that has been a, a significant problem because of uh, uh, the uh, financial, what's it called, uh, Financial Crimes Enforcement Network which is part of the Department of Treasury, they monitor banks and uh, really curtail the ability of banks to deal in the cannabis business with cannabis customers. Um, that has dragged in hemp as another form of cannabis. And so a lot of our clients have a difficulty with bank accounts, getting them and maintaining them. Getting bank loans, they haven't been able to do that. Credit is a real problem in agriculture in general. Mm -hmm. It's hugely so in something like hemp where people can't even go to their banks to get an ordinary loan. Wow. That's going to change. That's so, a lot uh, to look forward to. Yeah, yeah. So there's a lot of changes that would come with these amendments that are proposed in the uh, 2018 Agricultural Improvement Act that would free hemp. Excellent. I appreciate right. that explanation because <laughs> I think updating viewers is really important. Um, the other thing to consider, um, David, as we wind down, we just have about one more minute. Um, what would be for students, if we can get them excited about the foundation, excited about industrial hemp, what would be one or two projects that you think would be good for students to think of in terms of either doing research or just educating themselves about to help build a hempire as the okay. foundation likes to, yeah. uh, likes to claim? Well, those of you out there that are students of engineering, I would love to see more research on building materials. I, I think there's a bright, bright future for hemp in building materials and in making paper too. There's tremendous quality in the fiber of hemp, but there are challenges. Actually, it's a victim of its own, of its own strengths. Uh, it's a difficult material to work with and to process because it's a very, very durable, very tough fiber. But at the same time, that makes for excellent quality building materials and insulation materials. And I'd love to see more research out there by students of engineering on, on how can we make better materials for construction, not only develop the materials, but find efficient ways to make them in mass quantities. They can replace trees, save some forests. Uh, so that's one thing I'd like to see. I'd like to see more economic research. There's a, a lot of research that, that students in economics and agricultural economics could, could do. 
on the markets and where are the uh, where are the gaps, where are the bottlenecks in our markets right now, and how can we overcome those? How can we mature this industry? It's done tremendous in Colorado in the last four years. We have a long way to go, and that, that's something that economic students could look at. Excellent. Well, David, we have to stop. Yeah. We're um, okay. Uh, we're running out of time, so I want to um, thank you, David, for taking the time. I've been talking with David Bush. He's with the Industrial Hemp Research Foundation here in Colorado. And to learn more about the foundation, David, you want to tell us the website? Uh, the website is www.the uh, for the I H R Foundation dot com. We appreciate you tuning in, and thanks for watching. Getting high on anthropology. See you next time. I was born and raised in Colorado, the cannabis state. My parents are your typical strict Asian parents that never let their kids do anything but study. Any discussions about being an artist, dating, or drugs were forbidden and never talked about. When parents tell you not to do something, it makes you want to break their rules and just go for it. My favorite cousin was a role model for me. He was also a pothead who provided me with my first experience with weed. Though I was young and unfamiliar with how to use a pipe, it was a great experience that I hold dearly in my memory. While I enjoyed these times, my focus turned to school because I wanted to become a doctor or a dentist. My parents influenced my career goals and helped me to do well in school to eventually become an honor roll student. However, I noticed one day that my best friend Sean was ditching class on a regular basis. He smoked often and stopped doing homework. As I neared the end of high school as a time for partying and prepping for graduation, Sean, who smoked daily, told me about how he was struggling to pass in his classes. Maybe Sean and other friends of mine were rebellious. More than one friend of mine had a difficult time completing high school. Some failed. Since I'm very science oriented, I think I was subconsciously doing an observational study on my friends, comparing how often my friends needed to smoke to how well they did in school. This might be because I was heavily influenced by my father, who is a doctor. He was the one who introduced me to the science field. My cousin Vin was an exception. Being a major pothead, he was still an honor roll student and president of several clubs. In Maymester 2018, I learned that marijuana has addictive properties that researchers have shown that consumers of cannabis demonstrate a decline in academic performance. However, many different factors played a part in each of my friends' lives, so it's unfair to say that smoking marijuana leads to poor academic performance and addiction. My friends mean a lot to me, and though I learned that cannabis may have an influence on education and life chances, I think it's still perfectly fine if individuals consume cannabis on a moderate basis. It's obvious that additional research is needed on the effects of smoking cannabis such as addiction and cognitive impairment. Also, more studies are needed to examine how chronic users of cannabis are able to live successful lives. Are you a cannabis user who is a functioning individual?